Hello all, Eric here. So if you are not a big fan of advertisements disrupting the flow of an interview, <laughs> there is an option. Go to patreon.com slash most notorious and for just $2 a month, get all my episodes ad free. This will not only be for the Most Notorious podcast, but also for my new podcast debuting in September of 2018 called Where Blood Runs Cold, a collection of terrifying historical true crime stories from my home state, Minnesota. And for $4 a month, you'll not only get the ad-free episodes, but bonus content as well, including extra episodes, special commentary, and more. So skip the ads, support the show, and listen to new stuff by going to patreon.com slash most notorious. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash most notorious. See you there. Cheers. Now back to the interview. Welcome, everyone, to the Most Notorious Podcast. I'm Eric Rivenis. Happy to have you here with me. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today Stacy Horn, author of Damnation Island, Poor, Sick, Mad, and Criminal in 19th Century New York. Thanks so much for joining me. Thank you for inviting me. I've got to say I've read a lot of books for this podcast, but yours is one of the most disturbing I've ever read. And I say that as a compliment, because you're really able to articulate the absolute horrors that happen in this collection of places in your book. Could you describe for my listeners what Blackwell's Island was, the origins of the island, and how an asylum came to be built on it? Sure. Uh, Well, it was early in the 19th century, and Bellevue, which is now um, mostly known as a public hospital, at the time... Um, also um, housed the city's lunatic asylum, and that's what it was called at the time, um, to penal institutions and the almshouse for the poor. And as a result, the conditions there were horribly overcrowded and inhumane. The city, you know, searched around for an alternative, and they ended up buying Blackwell's Island, which is like a two, thin two-mile-long island in the East River between Manhattan and Queens. And at the time, it was owned by just one family, and it was mostly fruit orchards. So their plan was to build replacement institutions on this island. They'd build a new lunatic asylum, um, a new workhouse, which was a prison, and the penitentiary, which was also a prison, and a new almshouse. And they researched it, and they they did everything they could to build state-of-the-art institutions with new revolutionary treatments. And the idea was that they were sending people away to the sanctuary, and they were going to either reform them or heal them and then send them back to Manhattan in better shape than when they left. But it it all went south um, almost immediately, one by one as each institution went up, it, they just kept making the same mistakes over and over, and they turned into these horrible places, which I write about in the book. And this goes back to the 1830s, correct? Yeah. And Charles Dickens even visited early on, right? Yeah, he visited the lunatic asylum about three years after it um, began, and he wrote that it had that madhouse air the, the moping idiot, the gibbering maniac with his hideous laugh and pointed finger, they were all there in naked ugliness and horror. So there's a long history to this island. It was being used for these purposes from the 1830s all the way up to the turn of the 20th century. Different buildings are added at different points, of course, but I'd love it if you could talk about some of the uses of these buildings on the island. And by the way, the names of these buildings 
sound quite idyllic. Pavilions, lodges, retreats. Would you explain the different buildings, what each was for, and who was housed where, etc.? Well, the Lunicus, first of all, the focus was uh, most of the people that went there were poor people. For instance, the lunatic asylum, when um, members of wealthy families uh, developed mental disorders, they were sent to um, a private asylum called Bloomingdale, um, which was much, much nicer. So the only people being committed to the lunatic asylum on Blackwell's Island were the people who could not afford Bloomingdale. And that was true for all the institutions. There was a hospital there, but it was a hospital for poor people. The almshouse was clearly for poor people. These were people that, you know, had no money and no place to live. And the only two places that should have been more democratic were the penal institutions. It shouldn't matter whether you're wealthy or poor. If you committed a crime, you should go to jail. But um, And we can talk about this later, but that was not the case. Um Basically, the wealthy almost never were sent to prison, and only the poor ended up on Blackwell's Island. So, let me see. So, the Lunatic Asylum, well, let me just first say, like, what the problem was and why each institution just fell into these terrible places so quickly. And it was because they just made these same mistakes over and over again. They underestimated just how many people... Um, like just how large these groups were and how many people they would have to um, house there. They underestimated just how expensive it would be. And it was run by three commissioners who were part of a department called the Department of Public Charities and Correction. So three people who were politically appointed, so they didn't have experience in these areas, were responsible for both public charity charitable institutions and penal institutions, and it created this terrible association in the public's mind that all these people were basically one and the same. Poor people, people suffering from mental illness, and criminals basically were all guilty of something, and they all belonged together, and isolating them on this island just reinforced that association and and, and this us-versus-them uh, attitude on from the public. So the Lunatic Asylum, it, it was originally built to house 200 people. Um, they thought that would be enough, but they were overcrowded within a year. So they started building um, additional um, structures to house other people committed there. And that was what, what you were referring to. They went by names like the Retreat and the Lodge. But the Retreat and the Lodge... Um, was where they um, housed the most violent uh, patients. And so they became quickly the most notorious buildings associated with the Lunatic Asylum. And by the way, all these problems were open knowledge. Um, reporters um, wrote about it regularly. So the public knew about the retreat in the lodge. They were infamous. They also threw up these um, buildings called pavilions. You also referred to them. But they were no more than wooden shanties, and they were very dangerous and very inhumane. And I write about a reporter named Nellie Bly um, who wrote about the Lunatic Asylum um, later in the 19th century. But she was an, an investigative reporter who feigned mental illness in order to get committed to the asylum. And the one thing I learned researching her was her original intention was to get committed um, and get sent to either the retreat or the lodge. But she instead was sent to the main building of the asylum, which was the nicest part of the asylum. Like whenever there was a grand jury investigation or senators wanted to investigate asylum abuses, they were always taken to the main building where the patients in the best possible condition were housed. And that's where she was sent. And she wrote her art articles for the New York World, which were eventually put together in a book called Ten Days in the Madhouse. And her stories there are so horrifying and this was in the best part of the of the asylum and she says you know i had intended to go to the retreat in the lodge but when i saw how bad it was here i i just nixed that plan she would have been taking her life in her hands if she had um been housed in one of these two buildings and i write about a murder that took place 
in the retreat in my book. So a lot of this book focuses on the women's asylums, and the women and men were separated. And there are various stories throughout your book about women being declared insane while being far from it. Many just simply couldn't speak any English, and often these doctors did not screen incoming patients properly. Could you explain the common processes for diagnosing insanity and the kinds of women who were being put into these facilities? Well, it was frighteningly easy to get uh, committed to Blackwell's Island. As you said, like sometimes a, a woman was brought into police court and they couldn't find or didn't want to bother finding an interpreter, and so they'd send her to the lunatic asylum because she didn't speak English. Husbands could have wives sent there. You basically had to get um, so, someone from police court to um, sign a, a, a certificate of a commitment, and that could be bought. Um, or you could have doctors um, say that the person was insane. Again, their um, testimony could be bought. What was sadder to me was, as I was researching the book, um, I came across, well, there was a Senate investigation in 1880, and there was this 900-page uh, report that came uh, was put together as a result of that investigation. And they interviewed one doctor, and he talked about how when he was first assigned there, he went through all the records of all the women who were in the asylum at the time. And I forget the number, I don't know offhand, but it was like something like 85 women were there with absolutely no records. They don't know who sent them there, when or why, and they just remained there and 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 without explanation. I just thought that was terrible. You could have a lifetime commitment and nobody even knows why. One of the more endearing figures in your book is the Reverend French. I'd love it if yeah. you could explain what brought him to the island and what his role was there. Thank God for Reverend French. Uh, it was Writing this book was a challenge just because so many records were destroyed. Um, and so I had to piece together what went on in the island and what it was like um, from the inside based on... Uh, on this hunt for records, and I luckily came across um, Reverend William Glenny French. He was an Episcopal missionary to the island, uh, and he was there from 1872 to 1895, and he wrote an annual report every year of his work there, and he structured it based, like he would walk the length of the island going from institution to institution, and so his, his annual reports were based on, from the order of the institutions, like he would write about the Lunatic Island, the Lunatic Asylum first, because that's the first institution that he came across. And then you go from institution to institution in his annual report. So I actually copied him in my book. I did the exact same thing. I, I structured the book, book based on each institution in the order that you come upon them. And he wrote about it with such heart and, and from a point of view that wasn't politically motivated. Uh, I also, for instance, read um, the Department of Public Charities and Corrections. Uh, they also had to put together an annual report every year, and each warden or superintendent for each institution had to talk about you know, what had gone on in their institution that year. And by the way, the, some of those were also very frank and, and, and revealing. Um, but Reverend French just had a different point of view, and he told these stories. He, he talked about people specifically, and it was very hard to get stories of the people inside these institutions. I mean, if you're – I mean, I've, I've been researching um, for a long time various stories, and I find that if you're wealthy – and this isn't a, a knock against people who are affluent, but there's just – much more of a, you leave behind a, a greater record. There's letters, there's books, there's articles, there's all sorts of things. But when you're poor, especially in the 19th century, you you get a record of your birth and death, hopefully, and that's it. It's very hard to find any kind of written record. So to have someone like Reverend French talk about these people um, as human beings and to tell their stories was just Thank God I had those. And so he became the hero of my book. I, I would talk about him and his efforts in each institution. 
and he was it was heartbreaking reading some of these because he was he was just such a good compassionate man and he was always agonizing that he couldn't do more and in fact he almost lost his job because he he always would carry around in his pockets something to give to the inmates on Blackwell's Island and he couldn't give a lot and he couldn't give too many but he always had either some candy in his pockets an orange an apple he would carry paper and envelopes and stamps so he could write letters um, for the inmates who wanted to reach out to their families or to try to get a job. And he paid for these out of his pocket, and he went into debt. And when his supervisors found out that he was going into debt, they felt like he was embarrassing them, and they called him on the carpet for this. Like, you know, you shouldn't be doing this. You know, you're embarrassing us. You have to do something about your debts. And he almost lost his job just out of being, from being kind. He was called out on the carpet for numerous reasons as well. He revealed revealed a little too much to a reporter. Uh, his, his supervisors were unhappy with him because he really tried to stop the abuses that he witnessed, but he'd get reprimanded because he was only supposed to be there as a, a spiritual advisor. But taking care of them physically, it, it wasn't his responsibility. Is, is that correct? Yeah, I... One of the things, like, in the 1880 investigation, um, this, there was, Senate, I mentioned the Senate investigation into abuses in the lunatic asylum and other asylums, and Reverend French was subpoenaed to appear and testify, and he showed up and he said, I want to testify, but I just got this telegram from my supervisor uh, and basically, his supervisor was telling him that uh, there was a possibility that he would lose his job if he testified. And French said, I want to testify, but I don't know what to do. And the senator said, well, what's his name? And they super they subpoenaed his supervisor, and so he came in the next day. And I include um, part of the exchange between the senators and the supervisor because it just utterly fascinating reading because they're basically asking him we are just trying to find out if these people are being harmed and we're trying to get testimony from people who you know don't work there you know who are not you know testifying out of self-interest wouldn't the most christian thing to do would be for to french to stand up for these people and tell us what's going on and the supervisor it's just answering no. His only job there is to provide um, spiritual counseling. He's not there to um, witness or report on any possible abuses that are going on. And the senators are going, okay, it's not his job, but nonetheless, if he witnesses something wrong being done, shouldn't he tell someone shouldn't he do something about it and the kept the supervisor kept saying no in in all different ways and he sounds like the most heartless terrible human being on earth like why would he possibly how could he want to prevent french from testifying these terrible things are happening he could help and then finally when i started to read between the lines of his testimony i understood that he was in it he was in a impossible position um the people that would uh, were on blackwell's island who didn't work there who weren't committed they, they were only there because they got a pass from the commissioners who ran the department of public charities and correction and they could revoke these passes at any time so he was afraid that if french testified they would no longer be allowed to send missionaries there and he's basically thinking we can't help if we're not there. So he wanted to help, but he wanted to help in a less public way. In your book, there are many, many terrible stories of abuse against the women inmates of the asylum. Far too many to mention here. The stories go on and on, both fascinating and depressing. Could you give us some examples of some of the more egregious abuses against these women by the attendants and the nurses? Well, what, part of the problem was um, to keep costs down. Uh, the commissioners decided to use convicts from the workhouse um, to work as nurses and attendants in the asylum. So that didn't go well. 
and a lot of the abuses were at their hands, although not entirely. Um, there were, you know, terrible nurses who were nurses' nurses. But um, the one of the things when they started the asylum, they were supposed to be following a revolutionary form of treatment called moral treatment. Prior to that, um, people who suffered from mental disorders were just thrown into prisons, um, put into straitjackets, and essentially forgotten. There was very little in the form of actual treatment or therapy. And moral treatment wasn't really uh, – it, it was very simple. The, the idea was let's stop putting them in straitjackets and in prisons and let's treat them with kindness and compassion. Let's put them in institutions that are comfortable and 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 kind and and not like prisons. I mean, it seems common sense. Like if we if we follow this and if we do this instead, maybe they will respond better. And of course they did. But one once they were quickly overcrowded, and the, the people who were in charge of controlling them. Um, started putting them in straitjackets and other forms of restraints. And I've, I just came across one horror story after another, and the one I keep using as an example is at one point they took a pregnant inmate and they put her in a straitjacket and they threw her into solitary, and they had solitary in a lunatic asylum. And they forgot about her, and she gave birth in solitary in a straitjacket, like alone in a straitjacket she gave birth. And I wasn't able to find out much about her, unfortunately. And I don't think the char, I can't see how the, the infant could have survived. And there's just endless stories of that. And the one that really upset me when I read about it, and I write, I write about it in the book, was, um, one evening in the retreat, um, a night nurse who, um, was there alone except for three workhouse convicts who were assisting her, um, heard a commotion in one of the rooms. Oh, and I should say that um, all the women, um, when the sun went down, they were locked in their rooms and they were not let out until the next morning. So she unlocked the room and she saw one patient in the process of bashing in the head of another patient with a wooden uh, pail that they use as a chamber pot. And there was a third inmate in there who was trying to get away, but the room was so tiny, the furthest away that she could get was only 10 feet. So she ran for help. A doctor took an hour to get there, and then he bandaged the woman's head and then started to leave, and the nurse said, no, you have to move her to the hospital. She's seriously ill, and she begged him repeatedly to take this, remove this woman to the hospital, and he refused, and she died. And um, there was a grand jury investigation, and they looked into it, and they issued a report basically finding fault with the commissioners with almost every way in which the lunatic asylum was run. Um, They also found fault with the doctor for not removing the woman to the hospital, even though the nurse had begged him repeatedly to do so. And the response from the the head of the, the man who was running the asylum was to fire the night nurse. That was the only person that got fired. That was the only person that got into any kind of trouble. And he fired her because he said that the woman died because of her gross negligence. I mean, it's just incomprehensible. But he said, he wrote that um, what she had done was she came upon this woman murdering another woman and she locked the door. And that was her big fault. And I thought about that. Well, what did he expect her to do? She's one woman. This other woman is enraged and in the process of committing murder. You know, what was she supposed to do? Stop it, you know, by herself? And her her real problem was that she had no help whatsoever. And when help finally arrived, this doctor, who was just a young man, you know, straight out of med school, but he was no help at all. Yeah, I'd like to ask you about that. One of the great dilemmas for these women is that if they were being abused and told an authority, no one would ever take their side because they were insane, of course, in the eyes of that authority. Right. That that I came across again and again. French said that at the when he t- he did finally testify at the Senate investigation, and one of the most important points 
that he wanted to make was that the nurses could be tyrannical and cruel and then when, that when the patients complain, no one ever believed them. It's like, well, they're insane, and they always believed them, uh, believed the nurses and the doctors over the patients. And the one thing I learned, I'm in the process of reading the book, that um, the doctors depended on something called an accident book, which was kept by the nurses and the attendants. They would note any kind of accident or injury that happened to any of the patients during the day, and they would decide who would they, they would look at and treat based on these accident books. Now, since the nurses and the attendants were very often the cause of the accidents and injuries, they would just leave out the ones that they didn't want to get in trouble for, so the doctors never even knew, like, who was in the worst shape. You mentioned straitjackets, but there were other kinds of restraints, right? Including something called a crib. Yeah, that one was the, uh, if you see pictures, like if you Google it and see pictures of it, it was terrible. It's essentially the same as a child's crib, but it's actually more confining. Like in even a child's crib, there's a lot of space for them to move around, to sit up. In the cribs that they had for the patients at the asylum, all they could do was lie down flat in the top of the cage, and it, it is a cage, was just like a few inches from their face, so they couldn't move at all. And I read this one doctor describe it, uh, was seeing a patient in one of these cribs, and he said he squirmed around inside of it like an excited squirrel. I mean, it's, oh, God, it just made me cringe reading that. And one of the doctors testified at the investigation that I mentioned saying that um, he didn't think they were so bad and, and really they couldn't build them fast enough and he could if he could get more quickly, he would do it. And the senators are like, you've got to be kidding me. And they said, have you ever spent a night in one? And he said, no. And they said, well, you know, why don't you do that and then get back to us about how bad it was. But the lunatic asylum, by the way, wasn't the only terrible place on, on Blackwell's Island. Like, in, each institution was its own horror story. Like, the workhouse. Like, that was a, a penal institution for people convicted of minor crimes, like intoxication or vagrancy. You know, homelessness was a crime, or it still is a crime um, in New York. But one of the things that I learned in the process of my research there and – was that um, for a large part, uh, like for a few decades there, more women were being committed to, or were being committed with greater frequency to the workhouse than men. And I looked into that, um, and it was it was a very large correctional institution. Institution twenty, roughly twenty to thirty three thousand were being sent to the workhouse every year. Um, and I looked into why, like, what were women being sent there for? And I found that they were being committed for disorderly conduct, which is a law that still exists today. And it basically says if you're making, you know, some sort of nuisance in public, um, the police can arrest you. And in practice, um, it was worded so broadly that it came to mean whatever the police and courts wanted it to mean. And they used it to target specific groups that they wanted to keep in line, which was the poor. Um, and at the time that I was writing my book, Irish immigrants and women. And I and I wasn't the only one to notice the disparity, and I, I, I came across other accounts. Like I even came across a warden who um, mentions this, and the, the Women's Prison Association mentioned it. Um, but another terrible thing about the workhouse um is related to the almshouse, which was where people who were poor and had no place to live would go. And it, because it quickly became overcrowded, um, what they did was they divided the poor into two categories, the worthy poor and the unworthy poor. The worthy poor were widows, children, disabled veterans. Anyone else, if you were poor, it was a result of your moral failing and your only option, if you had no place to go, no place to live, was to get yourself committed to the workhouse. So essentially, you're agreeing to be a criminal, a convict. And, and well, I think that says it all. Yeah, absolutely. I wanted to, to ask you about some of the other buildings. It obviously wasn't only the lunatic asylum that had problems. There were other buildings, too. And, and I wanted to go back to that. Oh, sure. But first, I think 
mentioning Mary Stanislaus is important. Yeah. Her situation was such a, a shocking example of how difficult it was to get out of a place like that once you were committed, right? Yeah. Uh, and I, I write about the fact that she basically it was a perfect example of the person who would have the hardest time getting out. Um, she was a, a woman. And I've got quotes from uh, superintendents of the lunatic asylum saying that women are harder to manage than men. Uh, she was Irish, and uh, I have this great quote, well, horrible quote from uh, a Dr. Ralph Parsons who was running the asylums who claimed, and I'm quoting him, the majority of our Irish patients are of a low order of intelligence, and very many of them have imperfectly developed brains. When such persons become insane, I am inclined to think that the prognosis is unfavorable. Also, um, Sister Mary was a Catholic nun, and Catholicism at the time was considered to be like this barbaric religion. And so she she had three strikes against us. She was female, she was Irish, and she was Catholic. So when she tried to get out, um, she went to court, and she actually didn't succeed. Um, even though there were doctors um, who testified that she wasn't insane, she could be difficult, she could be eccentric, but she wasn't insane, they found doctors who testified that they were bribed, they were offered money to um, appear in police court saying that she's insane, and they refused, and they were intimating that um, – implying, excuse me, that uh, the doctors that did sign the um, certificates basically had accepted the bribe, which couldn't be proved. And she was actually committed by her sister, wasn't she? Yeah, that was another thing. Like, I I, I can't remember the book offhand, but uh, I read another book about the period and, and asylums and mental illness in the 19th century, and they said, Families would often use commitment as a way of, you know, dealing with family members that they didn't want to deal with. They just get rid of them by committing them. And sadly, this was easily done. And she was befriended by the Reverend French. It's kind of interesting to see how these characters connect through the course of the narrative. And French, as you've said, was there so long, he played a really important role in the lives of so many of these women. Yeah. Another point I'd like to bring up and have you comment on are the many different kinds of dangers these women faced. Not only were they abused by nurses, but they were often placed in cells with violent cellmates. Injuries they received were ignored. They were starved. But there was also disease, correct, which could wipe out large numbers of inmates at once. Yeah, and I write about one, I believe it was a cholera outbreak um, that was raging through all of New York, but it Blackwell's Island was the most hardest hit, and this was known, and it killed me that even during the, this outbreak, the police courts were still sending prisoners there, and when people's um, sentences were up, they were not allowed to leave. I mean, who could do that with a clear conscience, send someone to an island that is currently suffering from a cholera outbreak, which was deadly at the time? And part of what the staff was required to do to keep these women clean was to give them baths. Could you talk about what bath time was like for these women? Yeah, I worked very hard to make people understand just how bad this was because I, I, when I, in my first version of that section, I thought, I don't think I'm communicating this well, but there was no plumbing at the time. So, um, there was like a, a procedure when you were um, committed, um, and one of the things that was supposed to be done after that you got an exam and an interview, you were supposed to be given a nice hot bath, fresh clean clothes, and sent to your nice room. And none of that happened. Um, you got the most cursory kind of interview and exam. And what they discovered was um, – Carrying pails of water back and forth to give baths to these women was just not feasible. They just did not have enough personnel or time. So what they did was they filled up a few baths at the beginning of the day, and then that was it. So whoever came through that day, whoever needed a bath, just had to use the same bath water over and over and over again. 
and I read a lot of descriptions of what that was like, and then I wrote my description based on all the things I had read. But basically, um, ten dozens, uh, up to maybe a hundred women were going through these baths each day, and they could be women that had been living on the street for years, so they'd been covered with filth, lice, and other vermin. They could have open syphilis sores. They could have been playing with their feces. So after a few women going through this, and certainly by the end of the day, it was more sludge than water, and it was moving. So you can imagine what it was like for someone who is, you know, genuinely suffering from some sort of disorder being forced to go in this water. And if they didn't, if they resisted, they'd have these attendants, these very brutal attendants, dragging and throwing them in and holding them down in this water. I mean, I can't think of anything less likely to promote mental health than to take one of these baths. And Nellie Bly describes life. Um, I, I, you know, her her articles were just priceless for me because so many of the descriptions that I read of what was going on in the asylums were written by the doctors. And she was one of the few descriptions I was able to come across where she talks about it from the point of view of the patient. Like, for instance, that 900-page document from the investigation, all the testimony is from doctors, nurses, and attendants. They didn't speak to one single patient. And so Nellie Bly describes the bath. And Nellie Bly also describes something that um, I'd been curious about. Um, I knew that um, the women spent a lot of their time in some form of restraint, either a straitjacket or this thing called a muff, which is essentially handcuffs covered by cloth, um, or they were just tied to chairs. And she said how um, they were all meant to sit, you know, during the waking hours and when they weren't eating. They were meant to just sit still, sit upright and still. They weren't allowed to move. They weren't allowed to talk. They weren't allowed to get up and walk around if they were like if if they were starting to like ache from being in you know one position all day. Even if they like turned to the side, they were told no, sit up straight, face forward. I I love the story of Nellie Bly. What a strong, amazing woman, especially for her time. Uh, I've read Ten Days in the Madhouse. It's a, a fascinating read. And she was one of the first investigative journalists in American history. And I know you've already given us a little bit about her, but could you expand a little on her experience on Blackwell's? Well, she, as I said before, she really was taking her life in her hands by doing this. And she prearranged with her lawyer to get out after 10 days. But there there was nothing protecting her while she was there. I mean, if a fire had broken out... She would have died. I, I tried to make this clear in the book that these buildings were just fire traps. They're little more than wooden shanties. and Well, actually, she was actually in the stone building. But still, the fire department was on Manhattan. So if a fire broke out on Roosevelt Island, everyone would have to wait for the firemen to get into boats, to ferry across, to, to carry pails of water to wherever the fire was. And anybody who had been, been caught in a fire, they would have died. If she had complained to anyone, of course, and she did, and she writes about this, nobody believed her. And the interesting thing about um, that was she said when she was trying to get committed, she tried to act insane. But she said, once I got to the asylum, I did. I dropped all pretense and just acted myself. Like everything I said and did was ha- just me. I wasn't pretending to be insane anymore. And still, she was treated as if she was insane, even though she was acting like a normal person. And so she writes about um, the people that uh, were committed with her. And this is another thing that was just wonderful. Like Reverend French, she was one of the few people telling the stories of the people who were there. So you get in a sense of who was committed there, why, and what it was like for them on the inside. And she was she talked about people who were essentially killed while she was there. And I read many stories like that of people. Emma Goldman, a, a well-known anarchist, was sent to the penitentiary. And she talks about someone who was abused um, by the matron there. 
um, until she died. And Emma Goldman refers to that as legally murdered. And I realized, oh, my God, that's the perfect way to describe it. And this is being done repeatedly. You could even say it's done today whenever someone dies in police custody. They've essentially been murdered, but nobody goes to jail for it. So, yeah, she she was housed in a place um, where she could have been killed at any time, either by a fellow inmate or a nurse or attendant, where the doctors would never believe her when she complained. And she was there for 10 days without any help. So it was very, very dangerous. She was an amazing, courageous woman and a great writer. I mean, you read her book, so you know. She's just very evocative, very well done. And she befriends a doctor, and some flirtation ensues. So there is, amongst this horrible experience, a touch of romance that blossoms, right? Yeah, yeah. I I, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't be absolutely sure but there was definitely, I mean, I'm sure there was a flirtation. It's just impossible to tell how far it went. Um, there was a, a, a reference to it in the later article when she was traveling for another book that she had come to town because this doctor lived there. And she says something coy. And he, the doctor wrote um, to deny that they, oh, the, there was a rumor that they were going to get married, and she denies it. But she denies it in a way that implies that they had a relationship. And he also writes, writes a letter to the editor to deny it, but the way he phrased it also seemed to imply that there was a relationship, that, but that it just hadn't led to marriage. One of the most frustrating things while reading this book is that over the course of the decades these operations flourished on Blackwell's Island, there were numerous articles exposing what was going on, multiple reporters going undercover to reveal the the terrible conditions on the island. But despite the constant reminders to the public of what was going on, nothing substantially changed. I mean, there were little reforms here and there, but nothing major or earth-shattering. And things just kept repeating themselves. It's it was heartbreaking. I mean, I read I guess close to eighty years of eighty years of my somewhere in the area of eighty years worth of annual reports, and I would just see you know the same problems being brought to the attention of the commissioners again and again and again, and in the course of this time, um, investigative journalists writing pieces about of the different institutions and the abuses there again and again and again. And then the papers would pick it up, and there'd be all sorts of outrage and from the public, and we've got to do something about it. And it's just over and over and over, and very little change. Like Nellie Bly probably got the most attention of them all. And as a result of her exposés, uh, the next year, the Department of Public Charities and Correction got a slightly larger budget. And so I said, oh, that's great. So I looked into, okay, what did they do with it? And one of the things that I write about repeatedly is that they were essentially starving everyone on the island. Um, They were not feeding them really enough to live on, or just barely enough to live on. And one of them says in the annual report, let's figure out how little we can feed them without killing them. And so after Nellie Bly's um, articles came out, um, with that budget, they they spent a few more cents per day on food. Um, She talked about the fact in the winter um, no one had – the women didn't have coats, so they bought coats. Um, And then uh, the the largest amount of money went to building um, a, a house for the nurses. And at first I thought, oh, my God, so most of the money goes to the nurses, not the inmates. But then I thought maybe that wasn't such a terrible idea because the nurses were um, living in the lunatic asylum with the patients. And I thought, okay, well, that's horrible for them too. So if anyone is so inclined to take their anger out on the patients, this would just make it that much worse. So maybe if they had a slightly better life there, they wouldn't they would be maybe slightly less cruel to the inmates but yeah and after i don't know how to put this but when i would see that inaction and lack of change repeatedly i found it hard to condemn them because i think we're 
we're still that that way. I mean, we still read about terrible things all the time. I read about terrible things all the time. Um, and what do I do? What do we do? We, I mean, if you look at each thing that I write about in the book, like how we treat um, people with mental illness, how we treat the, the criminal justice system, how we treat um, lower income families. I mean, we're still making the same mistakes repeatedly. We're still arguing about the best way to do it and not really trying things differently. I mean, I understand their paralysis. I understand how they felt overwhelmed. And I can understand how change didn't happen. I'm not ex- excusing it, just like I'm, I don't excuse myself, but I understand it. Among the many buildings where terrible atrocities were committed on the island was the penitentiary. Please tell us what that building was like and the kinds of criminals that were housed there. I start that section telling the story of a 15-year-old girl um, named Adelaide Irving. Um, I came across her story um, doing research at the New York Historical Society, and there was a very tiny folder full of letters from her to a prison visitor. And what these prison visitors were, society women would visit women in prisons trying to be a good example to them and to convince them to change their ways and lead a crime-free life. And Adelaide um, hit it off with this visitor, and she wrote letters to her um, describing her life. And so I talk about Adelaide just because she was only 15 years old, and she her she was sent to the penitentiary for two years for picking someone's pocket. And I looked into that to see if that was a normal sentence, and of course it wasn't. Most people, for their first offense, they would get 10 days, you know, perhaps a month, three months, if if somebody suspected they this was only the first time they were caught. But most people got 10 days. To, so sentencing a 15-year-old girl to one of the worst in, penal institutions in New York for two years was just crazy. I used her example of how someone can be sent to prison and instead of help, they're just dragged under. And so I don't want to go too much into her story. So one of the things that stood out for me when I researched the penitentiary was something that stood out to an early warden who wrote in his annual report that um, he, he basically said to the commissioners, and I'm paraphrasing, he said, you know, I can't help but notice that you only send poor people to me, and we know the wealthy commit crimes too. So, what's going on here? Why, why are wealthy people never sent to um, the penitentiary? And he says, like in my mind, that says that proves to me the power of money. And I'm quoting him now: the power of money to evade the law and escape its penalty. And the Women's Prison Association noticed the same thing, and so they conducted their own investigation, and they went to the courts just to witness what goes on. And they wrote about how um, wealthy um, arrestees um, were rarely brought in, and if they were brought in, their cases were either just dismissed or they were charged you know, some fine that they could easily pay, and they went home, and the only people being um, convicted and sent to the penitentiary were the poor. So what were the circumstances that led to the eventual closing of these facilities? It it was part of the the progressive movement of the 1890s, uh, right? People making a concerted effort to improving the lives of the underrepresented. Civic responsibility and the attitudes towards institutions like this were changing, correct? Yes. The the action, if I can call it that, in my book ends in 1895 um, because it was a very positive year. Um, many things happened, um, but the one of the main things was there was always um, a complaint about having uh, the, the Department of Public Charities and Correction as one department. Everyone um, into reform believed that they should be two separate departments, and they did finally separate them. So we had one department of public charities 
in one department of correction, which is still called the Department of Correction to this day. The Department of Public Charities, I forget what its title is now. It's a very long, I mean, it was the Department of Welfare for many years. And they started acknowledging all their mistakes, and they looked into what they could do about them, and they came up with plans for each institution. Uh, For instance, um, with the penitentiary and the workhouse, they decided that it was just so bad, the only thing to do would be to start over. And so they bought Rikers Island um, with the idea that they would build a brand new penitentiary and a brand new workhouse and correct all the mistakes that they had made on Blackwell's Island. For the lunatic asylum, um, the state actually took over the care of all the mentally ill in New York City. Um, the research was done, and they were they it had been decided that the state had been doing a much better job, and so New York City finally agreed to relinquish that care and hand it over to the state. And the almshouse was shut down, and a new one was built on Staten Island, which was called the Farm Colony, which was supposed to be a lot nicer. So my book ends there, and everything's very positive. Uh, well, I should have an epilogue to just kind of catch us up on where we are with all these things now, and whatever happened with all these different efforts. And, and that's when I learned, well, not a lot has changed, and some things that actually gotten worse, like the lunatic asylum. I mean, I I will never forget in the 1970s, I saw a documentary on a state asylum on Staten Island called Willowbrook. And of all people, Geraldo Rivera went in uh, undercover with a camera and shot um, footage of what went on inside Willowbrook, which was a state asylum. And it's I saw it in the 1970s, and it's exactly what I saw described happening in the lunatic asylum on Blackwell's Island. And what you see, what I remember, is he's walking down a long hallway and sitting um, the entire length of the hallway on either side of the wall, on the floor, often naked or in rags, were just patient after patient sitting in their own urine and feces, crying, screaming, rocking back and forth, some in straight jackets, I believe, but I could be remembering that incorrectly. It was, you, you just looked at that and you couldn't believe that this wasn't a horror movie, that this was real. And that's exactly how I saw uh, in many accounts, uh, read that the Lunatic Island on Black Hills Island was described, just the descriptions of Blackwell's Island was slightly more orderly, and I don't remember reading descriptions of people naked in the halls. And Rikers Island, um, I read uh, reports of what life is like on Rikers Island. I read the Department of Justice report on um, how teenagers are treated on Rikers Island. And just reading that you know, description alone just broke my heart. Um, when I was researching my book, there was always a fight um, to keep children out of prison. I I would look at these annual reports and I would find people, convicts, in the penitentiary as young as eight years old. And so they fought and fought and fought, and finally the age was raised to 14. And even though it was raised to 14, I would still find children younger than 14 in the roles of, in the census of inmates for the penitentiary. So to read that, like, over 100 years later, that we'd only managed to raise the age two years um, to 16 years old. So people, children, 16 years old, um, were being sent to the penitentiary. Well, I don't know. It's not still called that now, but sent sent to the prisons on Rikers Island. And they were being abused. And I, I include a couple of accounts of that abuse on Rikers Island. And it just... One by one, everything I researched, we just really haven't gotten very far. Blackwell's Island would later be changed to Roosevelt's Island, but not after Teddy Roosevelt, but but Franklin Roosevelt. Is that right? Yeah. And at first, well, it was largely, first it, it was changed to Welfare Island. And I point out um, that 
they it was called where, Welfare Island because at the time welfare was not like a pejorative, like it really meant you know something compassionate. You know we we're going to look out for the welfare of the poorest citizens in our midst. Um, and then it was largely abandoned by the 60s, and it was reimagined as a, a place for mixed-income, affordable housing for mixed-income families and to be diverse and, uh, you know, this utopia. And it's a, it's a lovely place. Now, I, I've, I've gone there many times to walk the perimeter of the island, just as Reverend French would have. And... It, it has a very lovely feel, which might be close to what it felt like, you know, back in the early 19th century when the city planners were um, exploring the island as a possible place for these institutions. And you look over to Manhattan or over to Queens and Long Island, and, you know, you're on an island and it feels pretty and there's trees and flowers. I also... um looked across at Manhattan and it's so close like you think it would be so easy to just jump in the water and swim across and would uh, according to my research you know many tried and anyone from the lunatic asylum who tried drowned because there's very very strong currents in the east river in Manhattan um, a few people from the penitentiary and the workhouse made it because they were just in better shape than the people in the lunatic asylum what buildings from that time period still exist today? Very few, alas. I mean, it would be so much fun, I guess. It's so interesting to be able to look at them and walk through them today. But almost all of them were torn down. Um, the ones that still exist is one piece of the lunatic asylum, which still exists. It's the octagon. And it's been completely renovated, so very little of the interior of it is original. But the, the the structure is, and the interior, even though it's not original, it's 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 in the it, it's similarly structural to what it was in the 19th century. And I walk in there; it's now luxury housing, and I just look up and around, and I think, oh my God! In the same spot, all these horror stories that I read took place here. It just had this haunted feel to it. And let me see what else still exists. There's a pathology lab that was associated with the hospital, Charity Hospital, which I write about. The ruins of the smallpox hospital are still there on the southern end of the island. That's what's on the cover of my book. Although I didn't really write much about the smallpox hospital, there was um, a hospital for contagious diseases on the island um, called Riverside Hospital, but it is very early on, uh, the Board of Health took it over and rebuilt a new hospital for contagious diseases on another island around Manhattan, North Brother Island. In fact, if you know the story of Typhoid Mary, that's where she was sent. And the smallpox hospital ended up being used as housing for the nurses and a school for nurses. And there's a lighthouse and then the original Blackwell family's home. And that's it. Everything else was torn down. So where can people find out more about you, your work, and your book? Uh, well, I have a website, stacyhorn.com, and all my books are available at your favorite online retailer. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. Well, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. My guest again has been Stacy Horn, author of Damnation Island, Poor, Sick, Mad, and Criminal in 19th Century New York. This has been another episode of the Most Notorious Podcast, broadcasting to every dark and cobweb corner of the world. I'm Eric Rivenis, and have a safe tomorrow.